At this time, I'm pleased to report, present the report of the nominating committee for 2021. The slate was officially elected at the October Board of Directors meeting. I would ask those present to just give you a wave as I call your name, and please hold your applause till we recognize everyone. Nominated and elected to the class of 2022, David Texera, the mattress maker of New England, Donald Donaldson, Beantown Builders, Albert Senesey, Victory Human Services, Lisa Stratton, The Enterprise, Wicked Local, Andrew St. Pierre, Brockton uh, Plumbing Supply, nominated and elected to the class of 2023, Paul Anganetti, Bank of America, Jenny Mather, JM Pet Resort, Carol Chin, McDonald's, Matthew Hesketh, Good Samaritan Medical Center, Kelly Mallory, Mallory Headset, nominated and elected to the class of 2024, I feel like I'm at Bridgewater State with all my friends over here, George Spilios, Crown Uniform and Linen Service, Todd Copeland, Copeland Auto Group, Rick Fisher, Bluestone Bank, and Michael Lambert, Brockton Area Transit Authority. I would like to ask all Metro South Chamber of Board meeting, uh, Chamber members in attendance to please rise at this time along with all of the folks that I just mentioned. How about a round of applause for their service? Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much for your service to the Chamber and to our region. The following will serve as officers of the Chamber. I'll ask each of them to stand as I read their names and remain standing until all are introduced and you can hold your applause till all have been recognized. Our chairperson, Joe Casey, President, CEO, Chris Cooney, Chair-elect, Rich Hines, Treasurer, Greg Hart, CPA, Vice Chair, Economic Development, Dan Evans, Vice Chair, Membership Development, Fred Weiler, Vice Chair, Community Affairs, Masa Kanbabi, Vice Chair, Government Affairs, George Spilios, and he's a pretty good guy, past chair, myself, Fred Clark. How about a round of applause for all of our friends standing? All right. As part of our annual meeting, we have the presentation of recognition awards. I'd like to ask Chamber President Chris Cooney to join me on the stage in presenting these awards. Our first presentation honors Andrew Ronska, President of Abington Bank, who is completing his final term of service on the Board of Directors. And under, under the heading of Better Late Than Never, I ask Kim Holland, retiring CEO of Signature Healthcare, to also come up to receive his Board Service plaque from the 2019 annual meeting. We were rudely interrupted, Kim. Andy and Kim, come on up. Please join us on stage. Thank you so much, Andy and Kim, for your service. Our next presentation honors those who have earned the 2021 Metro South Economic Impact Award. Today we honor 10 companies who have made a significant economic impact in our region, creating jobs and adding to our rich business culture by providing valuable products, resources, and services to help our region thrive. Combined, these businesses have already invested millions of dollars and added more than 150 jobs. Each award recipient and their remarkable accomplishments are detailed in your programs that you all have. I would ask each recipient, as I call your name, to come forward and remain on the stage for a group photo. The Metro South Chamber of Commerce is pleased to present the Economic Impact Award to the first five recipients. Acting on behalf of Brockton Beer Company, Ed Cabellan, 
fusion dolls, Widlined Pyramid, Pyramid, West Bridgewater Self Storage, Dan Trout, Legal Greens, Vanessa Jean Baptiste, and Little Discoveries, Jessica Moscadelli. Could you all come forward if you're here? All right. Well done. Chamber is pleased to present the Economic Impact Award to the next five recipients. Acting on behalf of Vitra Adult Day Health, Max Voshin, Green for All, Dottie Fulginetti, Smithers Landscape, Josh Smith, New England Tortilla, Mi Nina, Mike Guerrero, Sycamore on Main, NeighborWorks, Cindy Pendergast. All come up, come on up. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of our recipients. Our final recognition award is the Charles A. Fuller Memorial Chamber Award. The late Mr. Fuller served as chair of the board of the chamber and was truly dedicated to our organization and to the community. For this award, I would ask the mayor, Mayor Bob Sullivan, to please join us on stage, Mr. Mayor. By the way, congratulations, Mr. Mayor, on your re-election. This award recognizes an individual whose leadership performance, personal example, and good influence has done the most to, to advance the welfare of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and its community. This year's award is shared by Margaret LaForest and Susan Whitaker of the Massachusetts Office of Business Development. Margaret and Susan are truly extraordinary in their commitment to assisting small businesses and the communities that comprise the Metro South region. Since joining the professional staff of the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, Margaret and Susan have consistently exhibited an intelligence and resourcefulness in serving businesses where they are and in their journey towards success. They show up on construction sites and manufacturing facilities, around kitchen tables, and online via Zoom and other calls. No matter the weather or the industry sector, they show up to help, and they do help. Since the pandemic, they have reached thousands of businesses, providing critical information to those most in need of resources and guidance. Many of you might recognize them from their regular appearances on the Friday afternoon COVID recovery and resources calls that have been conducted over the past year and a half. These Zoom calls also fe feature the 
United States Small Business Administration, and our friend, the Mayor of Brockton, Bob Sullivan. Margaret LaForest is recognized as a thoughtful, results-driven, dedicated leader with over 18 years of experience in government and nonprofit management. Known for her communication with constituents, Margaret has handled over $100 million in private sector gateway revitalization project, projects. She also has extensive experience in organizational management and economic development. Sue Whitaker has over 20 years of experience in both the private and public sectors with a focus on building relationships and facilitating public-private partnerships to advance workforce development. In her previous roles, Sue connected businesses and community organizations with data-driven workforce solutions. She also oversaw, directed, and implemented a wide range of public-private development activities to advance business initiatives, services, training, and growth. We are so honored to present the Charles A. Fuller Memorial Chamber Service Award to two true business champions and community leaders, Margaret LaForest and Susan Whitaker. And Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> come on up, Margaret. Margaret's coming up. Yep. I want to give the uh, mayor a chance to say a few words. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I want, to, I want to welcome you. If you're not from the City of Champions, you are today. We always welcome everybody here in the City of Brockton. Many, many, many of you are, are dear friends, uh, and some of you are my new friends during, uh, during what I call the COVID term, which has been the last two years. But I do want to thank the Chamber. I want to thank Chris and his leadership team for 18 months We've been doing over a thousand participants on these calls, and Sue and, and Margaret have been really the catalyst for this discussion. So Brockton is always open for business. We didn't pause construction during COVID. Uh, you know, we're better together. And so as a Brocktonian, I always give Margaret the business. She's from Quincy, which is the city of presidents, but we're the city of champions. So I, I, I want to thank I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank the uh, the healthcare industry, the banking industry, of course, educational. I mean, there's just so many different people that I could could just thank. But at the end of the day, uh, we need to continue to keep the train moving down the track. So participating in the chamber and uh, and listening and learning of what amenities the Commonwealth can provide through the leadership of both Sue and, and, and Margaret is really a catalyst for great success in the city of Brockton. So could you do me one more favor? If you're a veteran, please stand right now. Has to be at least one vet. Thank you, Corey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. So again, tomorrow is, is Veterans Day and we have a parade every year. So we would not be here without the sacrifices of the men and women that serve our nation or have served our nation. So, Corey, thank you for your service. And at this, I'm going to open it up to the, to the Margaret, the recipient. Thank you all so kindly. This is, Sue and I really ex appreciate you recognizing us. The Baker Polito administration also wants to buy stock in Brockton, Mayor Sullivan. Yes, yes. When uh, Sue and I came on the Mass Office of Business Development, we were given a directive to make Brockton our home base. We have been so welcomed by Chris Cooney and the team at the Metro South Chamber. You truly are our favorite. You've been one of the most consistent across the Commonwealth with these small business calls. We're always, Sue and I are both always a resource. Our conversation varies to how government can support each of your businesses. It is our job to connect you to any program, grant, or incentive offered by the Commonwealth or any of our quasi-agency partners. So our sincere gratitude and uh, thank you for your commitment to the Chamber. Truly, what a, what a room of people who are committed to Brockton, to improving your community and doing better and growing your business and partnering together. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Congratulations, Margaret, Sue. Sue couldn't be here, by the way, because she had a water skiing injury, and uh, that must have been fun. It must have been at DW Field Park, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure where that could have occurred. 
Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. And again, Margaret and Sue, congratulations. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Alex Langshire, EVP, Global Google Technology at, at Dentsu. Alex is the founder and past CEO of Cardinal Path, a highly respected and market-leading data analytics and digital marketing, marketing consultancy. Now a division of Dentsu International, Alex leads a global, this is not easy to say, global Google practice where he oversees delivery of services and capabilities across both the Google marketing platform and the Google Cloud platform. Since joining Dentsu in 2016, Alex has helped lead Dentsu to its number one position as the world's largest reseller of Google Analytics 360. A successful entrepreneur with two prior company exits under his belt, Alex has previously been a geologist prospecting for gold in northern Canada, a Treasury Board analyst responsible for Canada's space program, and an executive for an industry nonprofit. Alex is past president and director emeritus of the Digital Analytics Association, has taught digital marketing and data analytics for the University of British Columbia, and has delivered digital marketing training in the Americas, Europe, and APAC for Google. He's a graduate of a great institution, McGill University, and holds a Master of Science degree in Earth Sciences from the University of Ottawa. He lives in Medford with his, two, with his wife and two sons, and a golden retriever. You found that gold after all, yeah, golden yeah, yeah. retriever. Please join me in welcoming Alex Lank Lankshire. Thank you, Fred. I have to say, um, I have to say that it's one of the most painful things is to hear you being introduced. It just seems to go on and on forever, but thank you very much for that. And I want to share something with you. This is the first time I'm on stage uh, since February 26th of 2020. So I do a lot of keynote speaking in my capacity at uh, Cardinal Path and at Dentsu. And um, so I'm, I'm putting on, a, I'm putting on not necessarily a suit. In fact, I, my suits don't fit me and I can't even tie a tie anymore. Uh, it's been so long. So uh, this is the first. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction to, uh, to speak, uh, the invitation to speak today. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's really, really, really wonderful to be back in a room with people. It's just a fantastic thing. So uh, I'm just really thankful that we're, we're, we're able to do this and get life back to normal again, because it's just, we really miss this. It's great. It's really great. Uh, so I'm just going to pull this out here and say, uh, I have a talk today, and the talk is, I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, what, what would be something that would be really relevant given the role that I currently do? And I decided to, to focus in on something called Google. I think many of you have heard of it. And the reason why I want to focus in on Google is because all of you, if you're running a business, whether you know it or not, you have a relationship with Google. And many of us don't understand the importance of that relationship. And if we don't understand the importance of that relationship, then we're not managing it appropriately. And as I hope to show you by the end of today's talk, uh, this relationship is probably one of the most important relationships that you have today, and the direction of travel of Google tomorrow will influence your businesses tomorrow. So that's what I hope to get through today. Uh, so let's begin. So Chris gave, uh, a, sorry, Fred gave a very nice introduction for me, but I want to just bring it down a bit and just share a little bit about myself in a, in a more personal way. Uh, so I'm, as you probably heard, I, I look for Golden Robe in Canada. I'm Canadian. I'm now an American citizen. I'm so happy about that. Uh, when I moved to the United States, I took a job as the VP of Client Services for an IT outsourcing firm. And that was about 2000. And things went really, really well. And the firm kept growing and growing and growing. And then something happened in 2001. Does anybody remember what happened in 2001? the dot-com bomb, right? We had that recession. And I had clients calling me up and saying, Alex, I'm being walked out the door at five. If you don't fax me, fax, fax me my invoice, 
you're not going to get paid. And within five months, that business disappeared. Everybody got laid off. I had just had a big birthday. Um, we had a child. We wanted to have a second child. I just bought my house in Medford. I'm a northerner, so we just bought our house in Medford. And I had a 7.55% mortgage at the time, which is kind of crazy. And what happened to me is I, I got depressed. I fell into depression. And I, I raised this because, you know, mental illness is a really, it's a terrible thing. And I couldn't get out of bed, and I was really down for about three or four months before my wife said, you need to get help. So I did. And the meds worked, and I slowly came out of that depression. And one of the things that I realized as I came out of that depression was that I was never going to allow somebody else to control my future again. I was going to take control of my, my destiny. And I was in the United States of America, and I decided to become an entrepreneur. So I, one of the reasons I wanted to say yes when I was invited to speak here is because a lot of you are entrepreneurs. And I just love, love, love entrepreneurship. So what happened was I thought this thing called the internet was going to be big. So I decided to become an internet consultant. And remember, my degrees are in earth sciences, so uh, not a lot of relationship there. So out of the spare bedroom of, the, of my soon-to-be second son's um, birth, prior to his birth, uh, I started a company called Cardinal Path. And that company grew and grew and grew. And one of the major decisions that we made at Cardinal Path was uh, to side, uh, align ourselves to Google. So I had this little idea that Google was going to be really, really important. And I figured that if we just got behind it, we could just draft our way forward. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, in 2016, in 2015, I put the company up for sale. And in 2016, this was the uh, headline on the Wall Street Journal Online edition. And so we had that exit. And it was a, a really wonderful, wonderful moment. Um, and, I, and I bring this up for you uh, because you know, the idea of entrepreneurship is something that's really fundamental to me. And the idea that Google is critical to our businesses today is also something that's very fundamental to me. And it should be fundamental to you. Because if you're not managing your relationship with Google, if you're not thinking about your relationship with Google, as I will show you today, then you're missing out on something really fundamental to the growth of your business going forward, no matter what the business is. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, I want to talk to you about three things. The first one is I want to kind of contextualize why Google is so important. The second thing is I want to link that to mobile because the next big, big thing is mobile. And the importance of understanding the criticality of mobile to the experience and the customer experience can't be underscored. I want to then shift and talk a little bit about what's going on in the commerce wars because all of that's going to impact us in big and fundamental ways. And then I want to kind of leave you with something very inspirational about the future by talking about Alphabet's big bets are. Because the parent company for uh, Google is Alphabet, which is kind of alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. So it's like early bets, alphabet. Yeah. OK, next slide. Um, so let's try and understand what's going on with Google. Right? So Google just announced its third quarter results uh, on 26th of October. And the third quarter results <laughs> indicate that Google made about $19 billion. I feel like I got to be like Dr. Evil and say that, but $19 <laughs> billion in that quarter, right? Which is on track to do about $75 billion in the year. Now that's more than the GDP of most countries on the planet Earth. And that's net profit. Think about that. That's net profit. Now, the thing about it is when you look at where Google makes its money, that's the important thing. Where it makes the bulk of its money yesterday, today, and tomorrow is in this little thing called search. And that's the light blue of the G up here. Right? That's where it makes the bulk of its money. And that's the part of the Google pond that most of you are likely going to be swimming in. The direction of travel for Google, though, is it understands the criticality of mobile, it understands the criticality of video, and it understands that TV is being completely changed. My kids do not watch linear TV. They only watch videos on their mobile devices. 
that change is not going to, that, that, that evolution is only going to accelerate. And all of you are going to be able to buy ads on any one of these channels that are out there easily. Google's going to make that happen. So that little bit of red where YouTube is, it's going to be much bigger as people start to put a lot of ads there. So that's where Google makes its money. Next slide. Now, how did Google build this franchise? It built the franchise because they realized that the second something is digital, it's measurable. The second something is digital, it's measurable. So Google knows, and, and this is for real, Google knows um, basically who you are, it knows where you've been, it knows what you like, it knows who your friends are, it knows what your future plans are, it knows what devices that you have and how they're connected to one another, and it understands your financial life. Let's unpack just one of those, right? How does Google know what devices you have? Most of you have a phone. Many of those phones are Android devices. Most of you have Gmail. Most of you have used Chrome as a browser. If you've logged into any of those things, Google stitches the devices together. So if you log in on your laptop with Chrome, and then you log in on your mobile phone, and then you log in on your TV, and then you log in on your car with Android Car, those are all stitched together, and Google builds what's known as a device graph. And because it's you, it builds also something called an ID graph. So their device graph and their ID graph are funda freaking mental to their enterprise. Absolutely critical. So if you were to say, you know what, um, I own a car dealership and we're getting these new minivans that are electrified. So I want to market my minivans, my electric minivans, to those people that are interested in it. Well, Google would be able to say, well, I'm looking, are you looking for an audience that are you know, 35 to 45, let's say predominantly identify as male, they have two to three kids, they have their own home because you've got to charge that, right? They take a number of trips. We know they've owned cars previously. We know they've owned at least one of their ho uh, house previously. Google knows all that. So we can identify that audience very specifically and then we can place an ad in front of that audience very specifically. And that, my friends, is catnip to advertisers. And then they're going to lower the price of that and lower the, the tools, uh, the complexity of the tools, so that anybody can do it. So Google knows everything about you. And until there's antitrust legislation, that will be the case still going forward. Let's keep going. Pretty, pretty amazing, huh? Google's getting into finances right now with Wallet and Google Pay. Why? It wants to understand that piece that it doesn't have, which is how much money you actually have and how you spend that money and when you spend that money and what you spend that money on, right? We like convenience, Google likes the data. All right, remember the, 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 the statement is, if it's free, it's because you are the product. All right, so let's go forward. Let's talk a little bit about search and mobile because this is super important. Um, next slide. Yeah, right. Got to go. There we go. So I have a pop quiz for you. All right. The first smartphone was. Sorry. Nope. Nope. First smartphone was the iPhone. When did the first iPhone get introduced? All right. I'll do a show of hands. Was it between 2015 and 2020? Hands up who think it was that time. All right, 2010, 2015. 2008, 2010. 2005, 2007. That's right. So the, the uh, first iPhone was introduced in 2007, just before the Red Sox won the Second World Series. An important moment. Uh, so here's the thing. Imagine the speed of adoption of this device. Everybody has a smartphone. How do I know that? I know that to be true because the data from the pre-research center looks at the demographic breakdown of these devices. And as you can see, if you're under 49, it's basically a 100% penetration rate in the marketplace, which means that everybody has one. Everybody has a tracking device on them, never mind the COVID shots. You've got a tracking device on you. And that's your phone. Now, 
Uh, you can see that for the people that are over the age of 65, it's only about 83%. I think, is that the number up there? It's 61%. So there is a demographic breakdown there. The thing that amazes me is like the 95% who are under the age of 30 that have one. And I ask myself, who are the 5% that don't under that age? Right? They're probably the Mennonites and the Amish and something like that, right? So you've got near ubiquitous penetration of this device. That's amazing. If you look at the stats for how long it took for Americans to get cars or TVs or radios or any other device, this, the adoption curve is way, way, way longer. So let's take a look at why Google is paying attention to mobile. Why it's paying attention to mobile is because if you look on the graph on your left, you're seeing the percentages of web traffic that are done on mobile devices. And the percentage is about 50, 55%. That means that of all web traffic on, in the United States of America, 50 to 55% of it is happening on a mobile device. That's really big. The next graph shows you the percentage of searches that are done on a mobile device. And in this case, it's 63%. Is that right? Yeah, it's 63%. So 63% of all searches are done on a mobile device. You're in the car. Hey, let's get some dinner. Would you want Indian? Let's get Indian. What are the Indian places around here? Boom, do it like that, right? I'm in an elevator. Nobody wants to look at anybody in an elevator anymore, so they pull their devices out. They look at their, right? right. It's true, right? We don't like our minds to wander, so we use the devices to, to keep our minds from wandering. So these data indicate something fundamental. And the fundamental truth here is that Google sees the ubiquity of mobile going forward. And as a result, Google decided to do this. They changed the way that they index web pages. Let's see if that moves forward. So it used to be that Google, whose mission is to index the world, which means to create a catalog of everything that's out there in the world, it used to be that they would look at web pages from websites. But as of March 2021, Google changed the algorithm to say that if you have a mobile site, if you don't have a mobile site, you're basically not going to get ranked. And if you do have a mobile site, then you're going to be indexed prior a priori. So that means that you have to think of the world from the perspective of your mobile device. That's really fundamental. So question, how many of you have looked, hands up, look at, regularly look at, in search results, more than eight pages into the search results? Look around the room. OK, keep looking around the room. More than six pages. More than four pages. OK, we have two. More than three pages, a few more. More than two pages, look around the room. That's probably around 15, 10, 15%. All right, so if you're not on the first page, you're nowhere. If you're investing money today in your website and you're not thinking about the mobile dimension of your website, you're basically throwing money out the window. Because nobody's looking at page two or page three. So you have to look at the mobile perspective. It's super important. You have anybody come into you and talk to you and they show you, they pull up their laptop and they show you what your site looks like, screw that. Get the mobile device and look at it from there. That's the most important thing. So we have to optimize the mobile experience. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. Google doesn't index websites. What Google indexes are web pages. And more specifically, Google indexes words. So let's go back to the example you want to get some Indian food for dinner. Around the world, there are these rivers of demand. Think of people asking questions into Google as like demand. And there are these rivers of demand based on the type and the nature of the query. In that river are no fish. Instead, they're keywords. They're the words that people are actually typing into the search engine. If you want people to find you, you have to think of your website, your online experience, as being a net across that river. Now, if you have words on your pages that match the keywords in Google searches, then you've got a smaller mesh. And the more words that you have that match the keywords, the smaller the mesh, i.e., the better the chance you'll catch a fish. If you don't have the words that match what people are typing in, you've got a very wide mesh. Nobody will find your site. So 
It's all about content, which brings me to my next point, and that is you have to be thinking about the content of your site all the time. Because if you have a relationship with Google, and that relationship is predicated upon the content that you create, which is aligned to the interests of the people that you're trying to reach, then you need to focus on that. Forget TikTok. Forget Twitter. Forget Snap. Why should you forget about those? Let's go and understand why you should. Because when it comes to commerce, and most of you are in the commerce business, and this even works for universities. We do a lot of work with universities, because of course kids go to university, generally the product, uh, the audience for that product, um, they're very plugged in, of course, on this. So let's talk about commerce. With me so far? Good so far? All right, let's keep going. Commerce, next slide. On the left-hand side is the percentage of searches where they're done in North America. So Google hoovers up 91% of every search. That means more than nine in 10 searches are done on a Google platform. Now what's the uh, second biggest search engine on the planet Earth? Anybody know? No, it's not Bing. Sorry? I'm sorry. No, it's not Explorer. Baidu? No, it is YouTube. YouTube is the second biggest search engine on the planet Earth. Um, and then after YouTube, you've got Google Maps is the third. Right? Find a restaurant near me. So here's the thing. Google has crushed it on search. Forget everything else. That's where you need to focus. Notice that the second one is YouTube. Now, the thing that's really fascinating with this, because they drove this to a trillion dollar company, the other trillion dollar company we need to pay attention to is Amazon. So Amazon, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see that 53% of all product searches are done on Amazon. And this has got Google very, very worried. What that means is that if you're thinking about buying something, more than half of Americans go to Amazon to search for it. And then if you look below that, 23% are using a search engine, and then 16% are going to their favorite retailer, their favorite brand. All right, so let's, let's think this through. If 53% of all product searches start and end on Amazon, and Amazon is you know, a trillion dollar company doing the most commerce on the planet Earth, Google's looking at that and saying, hmm, they're gonna get into my business, so I better get into their business. So that's exactly what they're doing. So next slide. Um, the, other, the other trend that I wanna put out here is the percentage of mobile and commerce. So we're seeing this massive intersection where people are buying online, and pe COVID drove out a lot of that, and people are using mobile to buy online. So the graph on the right shows you the percentage of digital commerce that's done through a mobile device, and you can see that it's approaching 10%. It's gonna be about 14, 15% by 2025. It's the graph on the right that I think is really interesting for people in this room, and that is the amount of people that are doing click and then pick up in stores is growing as a percentage of total sales. And I wanna move on just in case of time. Let's go to the next slide. So I wanna unpack this a little bit more and double click on that. So this slide shows you Google's strategy. This one image here does everything for you. And that is Google doesn't have sellers. It doesn't have any commerce capability. So what is it doing instead? It just partnered with Shopify. Shopify has 1.7 million storefronts. And if you want all of your storefront products exposed in Google search engine, They've just made an integration that's super simple. So now Google says, okay, I've got the 1.7 million searches, uh, merchants, which means I've got product, which means that people are gonna be interested, and I made that super simple for them by exposing it, and all the, all the commerce is happening on Shopify. Good for Shopify, great for Google. So they're lowering the effort curve in a major, major way. I'll show you how big this is, right? How big this is, uh, next slide is that Shopify loves everybody. <laughs> so Shopify did a deal with Microsoft for Bing. Shopify's done a deal with uh, Walmart. Shopify's doing a deal with uh, Facebook. Why? Because everybody else wants access to that product if you don't have product. This is super important. 
As a matter of fact, I'm going to come back to Walmart in a second here. Amazon hasn't done a deal with Shopify. The reason why is because you can go today and set up a store on Amazon and do Fulfilled by Amazon. It's incredibly simple to do. I was on a stage about two years ago in Vermont with uh, the, uh, the, the head of uh, e-commerce for the uh, Vermont Teddy Bear Company. And he told me that they had spent upwards of $3 million to build their e-commerce storefront. They'd hired Accenture, and it was a complete disaster. Um, and he said, but we finally got it going, and I just decided maybe we should also use Amazon. I called up Amazon. In four days, Amazon had our store up, and within three months, their store was selling more than our website. Right? So Amazon is allowing sellers, merchants like yourself, to sell through their platform, and it takes a cut, of course. But Amazon is growing based on that. Google sees that, and Walmart sees it. So Walmart's also got merchant stores as well. And we're going to see a lot of this, where they're basically opening up the platform so that you can use those platforms to sell your products through. It's a, it's a sea change in the way that we do business. Let's go to the next slide. Super interesting stuff. Now, what I think is really wonderful and amazing for most of you, and it's a little secret, is that as a result of COVID, buyers' patterns are changing. And so this was a survey that was done by PricewaterhouseCoopers. They had 8,600 8, people that they surveyed. And they said, you know, how has the pandemic changed the way you feel about buying? And I want you to take a look at the top one here. It's I am digital. I'm fully digital. And the second one is I am local. People understand, certainly in our household, every week we bought, a, we took takeout from one of the local businesses. We shopped at local businesses because we knew they were getting hammered. And it was, our, it was like a little thing that we could do. And I think that's extended elsewhere. So that's good for you. And I'm going to show you how that changes even more. Gen Z, right, who have all the smartphones and a lot of pow uh, purchase power, they plan to do most of their holiday shopping in stores locally. Good news for us, right? So let's keep going and, and, and pull this together with um, uh, the, the best of both worlds. So some of you have probably heard of BOPIS buy online, pick up in store. So BOPIS is everywhere. If you go to Wegmans, you can see it there. If you go to Target, you'll see it there. If you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, Best Buy, they've all got those spots just outside the store where you can just drive up and you get your stuff that you just bought. And if you look at the reasons why people like doing that, this is a, a pretty good survey. Most of them like it because they can see right away, yeah, that's what I ordered. And if they want to return it, they can. They don't have to pay shipping fees. There's all kinds of reasons why they like that. Uh, Walmart is gaining on Amazon with respect to e-commerce. Why? Because Walmart has the most stores on the planet, right? And so people can do BOPIS very, very easily with Walmart. In fact, we did that with one of the air conditioners we bought last year. And they think about 50% of most of the major retailers are now going to enable BOPIS, i.e. buy online, pick up in store. So if you're going, if you're going to manage your relationship with Google, and if you're going to enable commerce online with Google through Shopify, and you want to have people come to your stores, what I'm saying is that the, the trends are clear. And the trends point to people want to go to shop local. They feel good about that. They get that psychic yumminess. And they'll pick up in store. So it's good stuff. All right, so my time on the stage is brief. And Chris said to me, I'd love you to kind of end with something inspirational. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> I'm a business person. <laughs> uh, but I, I remembered something that I saw that I thought was really inspirational. So I'm going to ask you uh, to, to listen closely to this. It's a, it's a clip from Google that was done in 2018. So it's a little bit old. But what that means uh, for the future is even more important. And we'll play it, and then I'll just kind of link these things together. So can we play that clip? The progress with the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our assistant is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this. But even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. 
So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people, when? Today, um, night? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like upper like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Again, that was a real call. We have many of these examples where the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance. It knew to ask for wait times in this case and handled the interaction gracefully. Uh, was that freaky? Okay, so that was three years ago. Right, uh, that, and that was freaky, and um, and it's going to be baked into everything. So, I the 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 degree of data and processing and knowledge that's required for it to understand those two conversations and be very conversational with them, you apply that to all the data that you've given to Google through your interactions, and this is why I say it knows what you want before you know what you want. And that's what they want to do. Like, there's, a great, there's a great quote by Harold Robbins, um, which says, any technology uh, that is sufficiently advanced, and that's Isaac Asimov, sorry, any technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And that's magic. That's really magic. So um, where I want to land on with this, if I just land the plane and, and, and walk off the stage, is this, is that, again, I said it before, forget TikTok, forget all these things. Your most important relationship is Google. Right? It's by far the most important relationship you can have. You need to understand that relationship. You need to make sure some very basic things are happening. If you have a website, it has to load quickly. And by quickly, I mean milliseconds quickly. Um, you want to make sure that, uh, that it is optimized for the mobile experience more than anything else. You want to write lots of content. 
And here I want to almost, I want to implore you, I, more than implore, I want to beseech you to write content. And you can write content on just about anything. What's the number one YouTube search term? How to. Just yesterday, our dog, uh, my wife and I put our dog into uh, doggy daycare for a week because we were traveling. And we couldn't figure out how to collapse the cage. So she said, let's try YouTube. And sure enough, that exact cage had a YouTube video of somebody who had the same thing and decided to do. So I mean, silly, dumb, easy to do, there's a visit. There's a visit. So don't just think of words. Think of video, because video is indexed just like words. Um, and here's the best source of research you can get. Ask your clients, what do they like? What do they use? What do they not like? How, do they, how, how often are they using it? What are they looking for next? And use those things to just write or create content. Because if they're saying that to you, then that's a source of, of inspiration and knowledge that few other people have. So um, those are my how-tos, and I'm, I'm happy to share that slide out with anybody that wants it. Uh, I think that's it for my time on the stage. Yeah, that's, that's it. So I hope I was able to just kind of walk you through you know, why you have a relationship with Google and how important that relationship is, how mobile is the future, and very, very clearly so, and Google's making its bet that way, and how if you want to do commerce, it's never been easier to do commerce online. And don't let anybody sell you a commerce site build because those days are, are long, long ago. And with that, I want to again thank the Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to speak. I hope that was a good use of your time. Gratitude. <laughs> Thanks very much. Alex, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I know the Bridgewater table over here was scribbling notes as you were talking because they realized at the same time I did that just a few more lines of code puts me out of a job. <laughs> just a few more lines of code. Wow. Alex, thank you for, for being with us. That really was thought-provoking and a little anxiety building at the same time. Alex has agreed to remain. If anybody wants to catch up with him with any questions you might have, I talk with him further, so thank you for that as well. And now just a few final thoughts before we adjourn to some networking. I want to call some attention to the giveaways at your table. In collaboration with our friends from Brockton Beer Company, Minina, Concord Foods, Teen Challenge, Woodworking, and Hutchins Flowers, who's done a really great job with the flowers and also those individual flowers at your tables, as well as all of our major sponsors. Thank you so much to all of them for your contributions to today's event. Now, this is important. As a reminder, one lucky person, and only one, you can fight it out if you want, but one lucky person at a table will take home the flowers, but not the vase. So you're going to have to figure that out. Not the vase. The water is up for grabs. Um, courtesy of Hutchins Flowers and the handmade cutting board made by the carpentry students here at Adult Teen Challenge, the lucky winner is the person who has a winning sticker underneath their bread plate, underneath your plate. Don't spill it. Hopefully you have it. Watch my seat there, Chris. I'd like to remind you that our next event is the Good Day Metro South with Chronicles Ted Reinstein at Thorny Lee on December 10th. The event is sponsored by Cambridge Savings Bank. There's lots of lucky winners out there, I know that. Our next Good Morning in Metro South is January 28th at Stonehill College. We'll hear from Ken Turner of the Massachusetts Life Science Center. See you there. And in conclusion, let me just say thanks to a few people who made today's program possible. To our sponsors, our premier sponsors, Sharon Credit, Crescent Union, Credit Union, UMass Donahue Institute, BSU, our supporting sponsors, OCES, Eastern Bank, Northeastern Savings Bank, the Enterprise. We also want to thank Mayor Sullivan for being with us, Alex Langshire for your great conversation, American Express Small Business Saturday, Rich Morgan, Rich Morgan Photography, Brockton Community Access Channel, Cardinal Spellman High School and that amazing chorus we heard from, Hutchins Flowers for your generosity, BC Tent and Awning, Concord Foods, Brewster Ambulance, Brockton Area Transit Authority, 
Adult and Teen Challenge, and the talented chamber staff who made all of this possible. Chris, Emma, Catherine, thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for being here for the 108th Annual Meeting. Stick around for the Business to Business Expo, and don't forget to wear your mask as you're walking around. Thank you, everybody.